to make this possible. And your session today is Project Management Essentials for People Managers. Um, and your speaker is Annette Moore, who is the founder of Better Management Training. All right, we got lots more people hopping on, that's great. Okay, Annette, um, go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready. And Angela's sending that information over so that we can make sure we get all of your participants on. Fantastic. Uh, so just a little introduction of myself before I start my slideshow. Um, I am a uh, project manager. I've been doing IT project management since 2007. I didn't do the math. It makes me feel old. Um, I am living in Grand Junction now. And I also have a, a full-time job, but I am working on the, starting up this better management training uh, program business. Might be a free business in the end, and that's okay. And I, I started my business because um, I see that there's a lot of people who have moved to management positions because they were so good at what they did that somebody thought it was a great idea to make them a manager which is fantastic. We need technical expertise in management. The problem often is those folks then have no idea how to manage people or budgets or schedules. So I decided to start a little business at least to get some of my message and some support out there just based on a lot of years of providing project management training. So I'm going to start my slideshow and um, I am going to also post some links in the chat as I go along. So I, I got the chat up. Let's make sure I've got all this going right. And oh, I need to share my screen first before I do that. And I am sharing. Nope, not that screen. I am sharing that screen. All right. Are we seeing a screen that has uh, something on it? Nope, probably not. There we go. Are you seeing the presentation or are you seeing the speaker's notes? I think you're seeing the presentation. Yeah, it's, kind of pre it's the presentation. Great, thank you. I get confused with two monitors and Zoom. I don't use Zoom in my work, I use Teams and it just, just enough difference that I sometimes lose track. So welcome everybody. Thank you for sticking around. If you have friends who are interested in the topic, uh, I hear they're recording it and I'm always happy to um, provide some background and some additional information. The course here is Project Management Essentials for People Managers. Uh, there are hours and hours of training in the world around project management. So I'm gonna run through the high level bits and pieces of project management, and then I'm really gonna focus on how that can help you run a team with the offer for additional training uh, at bettermanagementtraining.com. Uh, my husband wanted me to make sure I reminded you that you can manage your speaker view in Zoom with the little buttons up at the top. Um, so you're, I'm sharing my screen and you have some little buttons at the top that can help you manage your speaker view if you're not familiar with Zoom. And also, I'm going to put a link in the window, which uh, would have might have just gotten emailed to you. I tried to email this morning, but it didn't quite go out. And that link will be to a document at West Slope Startup Week uh, with some notes, so that you can um, either download those to your local computer if you got a couple of monitors that might work the best, or you can print them out, which might be a little bit more time consuming now. So where's my chat window? Chat window, chat window, chat window. I've lost my chat window, friends. Sorry, I had it. All right, so that might not be happening right now. I'll have to send it out. How do I get to the, somebody tell me how I get to the chat window. Just a second. I know how to find it this way. All right, so there's a handout. Boy, that was way more painful than it should have been. Okay, 
So there's a link in there to handouts and those, hand, those notes should keep you uh, moving, moving forward through the conversation. Um, I would like to manage questions through the chat window. So if you have questions, if you can stick them in the chat window while you're thinking about them and they're fresh, there are a few places through here that I'll stop. My intent is to talk for about 30, 35 minutes and then have space for questions and conversation at the end as well. Since we're starting late, that might just get us done on time for anybody who might have to leave at three o'clock. All right, so now into the meat of it, the theory of project management. There are at least four major types of project management education out there. Um, I am a certified project manager in, from Project Management International. Agile management is often used in the software world, although it's creeping into other spaces. Prints too is really a European process. Six Sigma is aimed at manufacturing efficiency. So if you're working in manufacturing, you might look into some Six Sigma. It can be paired with PMI activities. Definition of a project. Regardless of what work you're doing, you have projects to do. All of the work that everybody does is at least divided into days. So you can make a day a project if you have a stream of work that doesn't have decided top beginnings and ends. But the definition of a project is a work that has defined scope, and a defined end. And typically financial limits. Um, scope is a word, if you've not been in project management before, it means the, the box of what's in and what's out. And we'll talk about how to define scope in just a moment. And this is a super simple little way to look at all the steps of project management. So when you're doing a project, your project planning is in scope. You should plan before you, you do work. And this is hard when you've got people waiting and waiting and trying so hard to get work done. But it's so important that you plan the work before you start, it, start before you start it, only to find out you started the wrong thing first, or you didn't understand your, what you were doing first. So this is high level what project management looks like. And so now why why would you want to approach project management, take a project, man project management approach if you're managing people? And it's because having a structured plan for managing your work allows your people to be autonomous, to have enough resources to do the work while they're doing it at the right time. And these people, this makes people happier. When they can work on their own, and they, they have a say in how the work goes and the schedule and the rhythm and the outcome, you give your quality loving folks a chance to be great and a chance to take what they learn from each project and do better. If you taskmaster one specific tiny little piece at a time, you know, like fill me, write me this paper, go sample that well. If you don't give them autonomy, they don't get better and they can't recommend improvements to you. And also, nobody likes a micromanager. By project managing your people, you give them some autonomy and ability to manage their own work. To right size your resources, it's critical, assuming you have a budget and not an infinite amount of money, you wanna right size your resources to save time and money. Um, and you also, resources are skills, not just stuff, not just tools and t-shirts and concrete, but skills are resources. And if you have the right team without the right resources, you're, you're potentially wasting some time when you could just get some training. So much training is free on the internet right now, but you don't know that you need the training if you don't do your skills and resource assessments up front. Using project management approach also teaches your employees and your customers to do the work right and to set boundaries. I also want to point out that hurried people do not do their best work. Some of us think we like to work in a rushed, deadline-induced panic, but the fact is, especially if it's something technical like software or uh, PLCs or art, rushed people don't do their best work. And stressed staff that don't understand your vision, they don't produce quality results. So planning the work 
saves you money because it saves you time. There's that dollar. So this slide right here is going to pop up a few times throughout my conversation. This is just kind of a, your breadcrumb reference. It's also an, over, an overview of the planning steps from project management. So now's the time to take a break and use that handout I sent you or just grab a piece of scratch paper and write down a project that you have in mind. I find it helps the rest of the conversation if you're kind of focusing on a single type of project. Um, that way you can get your head around these new techniques in a space that's familiar to you. I tend to talk about either environmental sampling because I've done that or technology, but that might not be what you do. And that doesn't mean that this doesn't apply to you. These processes are built for every type of project. Does anybody have any questions or anything you'd like me to jump into more detail at this point in time? I didn't see anything pop up in the chat window, so I'm assuming that that's not the case. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to defining scope. How do you define scope? It seems so easy. I want a pretty website. That's not scope, that's a vision. What does your website look like? The finding scope is the first thing you have to do before you can spend money. Well, you can spend money defining scope too, but start there. Please always define scope. Think about your life at home. If you're married or if you've had to work with somebody in your house and they tell you to put the dishes away only to find out you didn't put them away right. Well, you didn't understand the scope and that's a fair argument. So first, to define scope, set your goals right. Ask everybody who could possibly have an opinion about your product, not about the idea, but who's gonna, who's gonna care about success or failure for you. Get a vision of what you wanna do and figure out who must be pleased and try so hard to involve them in the definition of scope. If you're trying to reach a broad public, maybe you get a focus group. If you're trying to reach a specific type of community organization, maybe you get a, a, some friends together who are involved in that organization. See if you can identify some goalposts along the way where you can revisit your scope. And then identify any restrictions to actually executing your scope. Interesting story, a friend of mine was building a fence in her backyard. And as she started to build the fence, they had a good vision, they had materials, they had time, it was all good. And then they found out in Grand Junction, you need a permit to build a fence above a certain height. So if the work you're doing could possibly have legal implications, permits or uh, FCC if you're working in the airwaves, find out what those are and work that into your scope. So it's no good to build something you can't use. Other questions you should ask around um, defining your scope are what's my desired outcome? Will my customer be pleased by this? And can I get some employees or some staff or a consultant excited about the scope? Scope is gonna become just a step below your mission statement. So spend some time, refine it well, and write it down. Then to limit your scope, so it's not, it's not good enough to say, I want to do all these things and have a great description. Then you also need to test your boundary conditions and find out what you're not doing. And it will help you refine your scope. Uh, and the way I do this in my workplace is I often am given a task that's pretty and awesome and has a website and some interactivities. But to limit my scope so that I'm not promising more than I can deliver, I ask myself, what might my customer want once they see how cool this is? And I make sure I write down that that's not in scope because that's called scope creep. And what work might we find out through the process of building this website that's um, I'm not prepared to do because it's expensive? Like if I am building a website, but suddenly I find out my JavaScript is an obsolete version of Java. Well, I'm gonna write that version in because updating my JavaScript might be more expensive than I want to cover. So I write it out of my scope. And I also want to identify if there's other work ongoing that might interfere or might cross its boundary. And I want to make sure that that's either in scope or out of scope, but clarify the boundary. And 
this one has bit me recently. If I'm trying to make, to create a product, but, and I have a team totally willing, volunteers totally willing, but they don't have the skills. Should I write those activities out of scope or should I write them in scope and then add in the training or the external vendor to do them? And I also wanna make sure I write out anything else that's too expensive to be included and write it down. And the final thing I want, want to make sure you include in scope always is what does done look like? Start asking yourself that early. How do I know when I'm done? How does my team know when they're done? How does my team know that I agree that they're done? So where, however you're going to share the workload out, have that sentence, this first sentence, this project is complete when, or you know you're done when, explicitly state that. Who's gonna approve of it? And also, what evidence you want to show that that's done. Do you, want, do you need to see the web page? Do you need to see the concrete poured? Um, is handing a box of t-shirts over, does that meet your t-shirt order? Somehow you need to define what done looks like and who needs to be happy. Because the customer is always right until what's right is out of scope. Just a tip for managing people, especially if you've got large groups of people who are trying to get work done for you, make your scope available. Whether that's a work request system, which I highly recommend if you've got large teams, you have a work request system that links back to scope or your project documentation system. If you're running your project, you can do this all in Sheets or Excel and you can make your scope available out in the Google Drive. But if not, there's all kinds of old paper ways to make it available to your team. What's most important is that it is accessible by anybody during execution so that when they go down a rabbit hole of something really awesome and somebody says, I don't know if that's in scope, they can go find out. Here's another stopping point for notes. Um, in your project, what limits do you think have come to mind while I was talking that you should be considering in your scope? And who do you need to make happy? And finally, where would you store your scope statement so that your people doing work could read it at will? So the next part of the slide deck is around planning communication. I moved this up in the process from PMI because statistics show that most projects will fail either on overestimation or failure to communicate. And I think everything in the end comes back to communicating. So what's a stakeholder? Stakeholder is not a guy holding a stake, right? A, a stakeholder is a person who has a vested interest in your success or a vested interest in your failure. And I always mention that because I have had projects in the past with um, technical systems where somebody in another department may felt like they got ahead, they could get ahead if I didn't win, if I didn't get ahead. Good to know those people. Who has, anybody who has procedural interest in your process? So if you need a lawyer, if you have a financial advisor, they're stakeholders. Anybody who's gonna be inspecting your work is a stakeholder. And anybody who could crush your project is a stakeholder because you need to have a plan to handle them. And even sometimes those folks with passing interest can be stakeholders if you can use their passing interest to become cheerleaders for you. Find your cheerleaders, they're all stakeholders. And engage them early and often. So in just a couple of slides, I'll show you a template for a communications plan. But this slide is here just to remind you to communicate early and often according to the role a stakeholder has. Um, you can, you, so what I recommend is you list every single name and then you start grouping them by stakeholder type. Some people you'll find are in more than one stakeholder type. So you might have an employee who's clearly in your implementation team, but maybe they're a super cheerleader for you. So you want them in your cheerleader group. Awesome. So you can do that when you plan your communication. And then I would suggest that you meet at least twice with all your stakeholders before the project starts. But at a very minimum, you wanna meet at least twice with the people who are gonna be pleased with your outcome. So they can consider 
the impact of this work on their life and they can start figuring out how to plan your work into their lives. If you're managing smaller day-to-day, week-to-week projects, maybe twice before isn't necessary, um, but one way or another, meet with your team before the project starts. That's, if it's nothing else, it's called a kickoff, and you use kickoffs to make sure everybody's prepared. And you want their buy-in. And this slide um, is a little bit of an older slide that I made, but it describes why. Why do you want buy-in from stakeholders? Well, they really, if they're a sponsor, they, um, they care because they have to pay you. But your team will perform better if they're treated early as a stakeholder rather than just as slaves to do the work that you are bidding them. Um, your naysayers will, will find out. If you're trying to keep secrets and do work on the side, you had, need to have a good communication plan to keep secrets because secrets always get out. But when you're talking to people, keep in mind that emotional intelligence is the way to go. Get to know the people you're talking to and address what they're concerned about. Um, this little fly-in says a person is not just a resource. So please treat your people like people. This slide is a template, uh, a view of a communication plan that I have made in, in Microsoft um, Excel. It could be put into sheets as well. When I uh, make the PowerPoint available, it is linked to a live document. Uh, is it gonna come up for you? Yeah. So this, uh, it has three tabs. So up front, I list my stakeholders and the frequency of communication. What was up there? Um, frequency of communication across the top. And then I have a different tab for schedule, what's gonna happen when, and I suggest if you have any schedule that you put these into your calendar tool that goes with your email. So Outlook, Gmail calendar, whatever calendar you use. And then I list my stakeholders by type with, this is the dirty little secret. I keep notes on everybody and how sassy they are and how they do or don't communicate. So I might have a, a, a guy who never answers my emails or never shows up on time for our stakeholder meetings. I know, always needs a reminder. I might have somebody who gets grumpy with me if I email her at five o'clock on Friday, so I make notes about that. So that's the communication plan. And that file is available for you in the Western West Slope Startup Week uh, resource folder in G Drive, which um, I will share at the end. I'll, I'll share the link at the end. So here's a, a spot for you to stop and think about your own project, what you wrote down earlier, is what stakeholder groups do you think will be the hardest to reach? And who did you just now think about when we were talking about stakeholders? that you'll forget about later. Write them down. Do it when you think about it. And do you need to engage any professional services for your communication? I put that in there because you might find you need uh, some kind of person to do your social media. That's communication. You might need a service to provide legal guidance on what can be released or to write press releases. And all of that should go into your communication plan one way or another. And now the next thing we're gonna talk about here is breaking down the work or the work breakdown structure. You might've heard, heard the acronym WBS. And that's what that stands for, work breakdown structure. So after you have defined the scope, which we did earlier, you're gonna plan your work by decomposing it into work packages. So that may not be intuitive to you. I have some pictures a little in a minute what that looks like, but it's gonna be a tree structure. So if I need to lay, my, lay a driveway, my brother just put a new driveway down. The first thing he has to do is get a concrete company under contract. And then breaking that down, that concrete company will have to have a plan. They have to remove the old concrete, they have to lay a base, they have to get a concrete truck and so on. So all that work needs to be broken out before you start anything. 
And from that work breakdown structure, you're going to determine the number of people and the resources that you need. I highlighted here that you're also going to note what tools you need. Do you need shovels and hammers? Do you need good, fast workstations and not slow, old Dells from 1997? Do you need specific chemicals, specific materials? All that stuff can be identified when you break apart your work. If you don't break it apart, you may not remember, you may not know, and you might forget to order it. So here's a format of a work breakdown structure that I have used for an engineering company before. And this shows how you, you can break the work into phases, and within each phase goes a deliverable and the work product below that. If anybody is interested in some assistance breaking work down, I find that a super fun challenge. So you can shoot me your email address and I will be happy to, to chat with you about that. Um, just because I think it's fun to know what people are doing. And this is a work breakdown structure using not a fancy tool, but just using Excel. It's from this um, company called BI. This is a, from a blog post on work breakdown. But I thought it was super helpful to see how you could do that without any fancy tools. Um, here I have a break to ask if there are any questions or has anybody had any challenges breaking down work before that you'd like to use as a discussion point here. I will take silence as either I'm boring or you're enraptured, I'm not sure. Um, Breaking down the work can be challenging until you've done it before. What falls under work packages? Good question. Under work packages is tasks. So I will pick a work package. Um, my husband's been, do been doing the electrical in the house, all of it. So for him, he might have a work package that is outlets. Under work packages would be a task to do the kitchen outlet. So you break it down to the level at which things can be managed. Uh, if you're going to put this into a schedule, work packages might include things broken down to the level that can be assigned to one person in one week. Thanks. Good question. Um, and actually, I'm going to use this point to illustrate that if you are managing a lot of people, you should have a means of tracking what's assigned to whom and when it's done. And that can be done in Excel or Sheets or something free or nearly free as well. But if you have a system that can do this tracking for you, it, it's worth the investment as soon as you can afford it. So the next fun part is to schedule the work. And it is much easier to schedule the work if you've broken it down into work packages. So there's that to-do list again. So how do you start to schedule? I'm not going to work walk through how to schedule because that's that's at least a 10 hour course, but I will get you started. So you're going to start with your work breakdown structure. And you choose the level at which you need to plan. Um, so I'm working on a project right now that I have 2000 tasks. I can't really plan the tasks. I have to plan the work packages and then expand as I get more tasks. So how, what, at whatever level makes sense to you, you're going to decide figure out in your head using all your breakdown, how long is that going to take? So I'm going to use a work package and I'm going to say that work package is going to take me a month. I've got 30 work packages. So I got 30 months of work, plus or minus. And then I'm going to go through and see how many tasks do I really have and does that make sense and I'm going to adjust a little. But I always sort of estimate first and then expand or grow. So after I've added some duration to whatever level I decide to plan at. And now, don't be afraid to stop and start over. If you're a technical person, you'll be inclined to want to plan everything at the task level. And you can do that if your project is small. But if you have a large project, you might find that overwhelming. So just step back, take yourself up a level, and plan at a higher level to start. And after you've got your higher level plan, then dig in and answer the next question. Do I have enough people to do this? And this is not something you're going to do in a day. This might take you 80 hours of staring and pushing numbers around. But after you've got all your work laid out, you can do the people math. 
depending on how your budget lays out and when you get money. I would recommend you, you plan on people working no more than seven hours a day because in reality, nobody actually works eight hours a day, especially not if they're working for someone else. No more than, that math doesn't work. <laughs> 28 hours, sorry, seven times five is 35 hours a week. And do not plan for overtime because people don't like to do overtime. They do it because they feel like they should or they have to. So plan your schedule with enough flex in it that you don't use overtime, um, except for in emergencies. Overtime should be reserved for unexpected unplanned emergencies. An employee will go the extra mile for you for an emergency, unless every day is an emergency. And so that's about all I have on scheduling that I can say to a broad group because they're so specific to the tasks you're doing. And now I'm gonna get into monitor and control. This is actually out of order. I'm gonna jump back to, to a couple of pieces, but I wanted to mention this in case I were to run out of time, that monitoring and controlling is so built on all that stuff you've already done. You need a budget, you need a schedule, you need a team, and then you wanna monitor and control. And what does that mean? It means communicating with your team and looking at what's getting done. I put this in here, um, there's no robots. That's what more my eyes go to. I don't. So your team doing the work are stakeholders. They're not robots. They're not slaves. So that's who's gonna tell you how you're doing. So you should set up with them direct, um, complete communication of your work. Expect your team to be adults. Even if you're working with folks who are just 18, 19, 20, expect them to be adults. They'll rise to the occasion. And if they know what measurable goals they have and what penalties they might have, like no work if you don't, if you're, if you, if no call, no show, no more work, set whatever boundaries are appropriate for your project. Teach every one of your employees how to request a change because your employees are your hands on the ground. So say I'm building a website and I have a vision that I want it to be blue like this and green like that and I want it to have all these cool widgets. But my team figures out that if they do all those things, it's gonna be non-functional because I'm gonna have a conflict in the code or I, it's just gonna be ugly. I want them to know how to suggest a change in a way that's not hostile, that's not demanding, just here's my change process. And also let your team always know who's responsible for ordering and maintaining materials and tools. And it shouldn't be you. You might be responsible for the budget. I'm good with that. Right? You approve the budget and you approve the timeline, but you want a technical expert to tell you what tools you need and what materials you need. You might have to talk them down in price, go from the extravagant to the mediocre, but really get a technical expert to give you advice there. And if you are that technical expert, engage the next person down because you don't want to be holding all the cards here. You need somebody to be able to step in when you're sick or want a vacation or go for a mountain bike ride. I suggest that you hold a live review of your project with your entire team. Now that's not always possible if your team is hundreds of people, but you can hold a live review before you start work with the leads of your team. And the reason I suggest a live review like this, you can do it on Zoom or whatever tool works for you, is because nobody reads emails and announcements anymore. And then make sure you're following that change process that you said you would do so if, um, if Tasha brings you a suggestion for a change to your product, have a process by which you review it and you let her know the status. If you decide that change is denied, at least have a process to make sure you complete it. And then schedule, a re schedule regular meetings with your team. Again, if your team is huge, daily meetings sure isn't gonna work for you, but you might ask your tech leads to have daily meetings, five minutes is all they need to just be sure everybody's on the same track. And you can give them an agenda. What happened since last time we met? What's gonna happen before we meet next? What did you say you would do last time that should have been done? So action items are a touch point for me. If somebody says they're gonna do something for you, there needs to be a means, a person, a place to follow up. So if I said I'm gonna send you a project plan, 
by next week, I would like you to ask me next week if you don't have it. That's me. You can establish that with your employees, that accountability is the norm, and they'll start holding each other accountable. Whenever you're meeting with employees, admit when you're wrong. Admit when you don't know. So much more respect for you. People, people expect, respect people who are human. We all like personal stories, even stories of failure. It makes you more human. And then make sure you applaud every stinking little success. Even if it's just showing that work on time for somebody who maybe doesn't normally show up on time. Whenever there are struggles in the project, so there's a coronavirus, you can't get into the office, everything's running slow, just acknowledge that we all share this problem. And if you have one employee or two employees who are having problem behaviors, please don't manage the lowest common denominator and punish the whole team. Pull that person aside and have a chat with them. It's hard. It requires some wisdom and emotional intelligence on your part, but everybody will appreciate it. And if you lose your problem employees, that's not always the worst thing. But it is the worst thing if you lose your best employees because you punished them along with your problem employees. So questions for thought, I think at this point, um, have you had personally negative or positive experiences in work that you can inform how you manage your team with? And what changes would you make to the way you've been managed to manage your team better? So I wanna always help, help people aim for better. Does anybody have any questions you'd like me to address? We're running up on three o'clock since we got started late. If you need to jump off at three because you have another commitment, um, please shoot me an, your email address if you wanna hear the rest of the meeting or uh, more information if you need to jump off. Otherwise, I'm gonna go till I finish. Um, I, I'm on the overlap link, so this link's not gonna end and nobody's gonna take it from us. All right. So moving on to the next portion, work the plan. So we just talked about monitor and control. And, and here's the, the work the plan part. What are we really monitoring and controlling besides the team? We're gonna measure against the schedule. Are you on time? Are you mostly on time? You can give yourself space. You know, if you're a week late, is that okay? You should decide that in advance rather than fooling yourself later. Um, how are we doing on budget? Plus or minus 10% is pretty typical for a budget. If it's more than that, who are you accountable to? Who's paying for it? Um, quality checks. So I, quality checks is in the list of things. We didn't get there, we won't get there today, but quality checks should be instituted along the way. How do you know? We talked earlier about definition of done. Your employees should know what you're measuring done by and, and who's going to do those quality checks. So it's not a surprise, but those should be measured along the way. And if people are regularly failing quality checks, maybe you put a big measurement on the board or on your work page that says our quality is only 80%. Wah, wah, we need to get it up. But whatever you're doing, you're going to communicate how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, and just give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Um, final notes here. So planning um, beyond monitor and control. A lot of us are managing more than one project at a time. We're managing programs or we're managing, we've got people plus projects plus life. <laughs> so I'm going to suggest a couple of ways to plan for reality and handle multiple projects. Earlier I mentioned a few different plans. I don't know if I mentioned the word artifacts. Artifacts are what papers, what spreadsheets, what Word documents, what um, Slack strings you require to get your work done. Those are all artifacts. What artifacts do you require for every project? Have a plan for those. Make it the same for every project if you're managing multiples. Put them in the same place every time. People will get faster. And I list here some key artifacts that I would not go without. Who's authorizing the budget? If that's you, hooray to you for having a big budget. Make sure you have got that authorization written down somewhere. 
But if the budget isn't coming from you, if it's coming from a sponsor or a boss, make sure you got in writing the budget and the, the things you're signing up for. Don't let them say later you didn't do enough or, but I also wanted this. That's part of defining scope. Have your work breakdown structure someplace that it can be seen so people understand. Um, your schedule should be somewhere with measurement points. So are you looking at it weekly or monthly? Are you measuring big wins? Like in my case, we're getting ready to celebrate brand new databases built. It's not sexy and shiny, but it's done. Um, you should have your budget stored somewhere. Now, I know in all cases, storing your budget in your public documents is not acceptable. That's fine, just put it in the same place every time. And your communication plan is similar in my case. I don't store that in my public documents because I keep notes on people. Um, and your calendar invites. So theoretically, everybody uses an email system that has a calendar attached. So your calendar invites are all in one location. If you build systems around how you manage your projects, you will find that you get better. As long as periodically you stop in and say, is this, I'm making this artifact, nobody ever uses it, doesn't add value, you can throw them out. That's the benefit of being your own boss. But I show a, on the screen here a, a system loop where you've got controls, measurements, disturbances, so things will change, the world will change, Someday we'll go back to work and there won't be viruses. There will be a new president. These are all things that can change your process. You get new employees, all changing your process. When you change your process, change the process, change it across the, the board. And that is the end of the content that I have right at 